Ms. Bailey, would you read the certification from closed session, please? In accordance with the Freedom of Information Act, a roll call vote must be taken in which all members of the public business matters lawfully exempted from open meetings, public 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 if you will now please stand for a moment of silence and then we'll have the Pledge of Allegiance led by the Vice Chair, Ms. Whittington. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. My tears, my boy. Thank you. We had Reverend Lawrence Hayes to open up our uh, session before our closed sessions with a <clears throat> moment of devotion and prayer. We appreciate him coming tonight. Okay, now ready for motions on consent agenda. I make a motion to approve items A, B, and C of the consent agenda. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, motion and seconded to accept the consent agenda. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Okay, go ahead. I make a motion to approve home instruction for those families who submitted requests for the two 2020-2021 school year pending receipt of proper paperwork. Is there a second? I'll second that. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded to approve home instruction for students requested. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Okay. We will now move to employee spotlights. This month we are spotlighting our nutritional staff and just want to say a big thank you and recognize you all for all the work that you put in this year we know it's been a, a hard year for everyone but you all have stepped in and prepared meals and meals and meals and meals <laughs> and rode buses and delivered meals and helped to keep our kids fed during this pandemic time and during the time that we've been out of school from last march through every Wednesday of this year and through the summer. And we just wanted to spotlight you this month and show you how much we do appreciate you. Um, Dr. Stacy has a award first. Uh, yes, ma'am, Madam Chair. Uh, at this time, I'd like for Mr. Jesse and Miss Barton to please come on stage. This week, March the 8th through the 12th, is National School Breakfast Week. Uh, it, it's a celebration again of our folks and we're going to recognize the, all of our ladies here in just a second, but we would like to start off with Mr. Jesse and Miss Barton. Uh, they are the glue that keeps it together. Uh, many times I'm on the phone with them, and we're not going to be in school tomorrow, but I need you to feed 5,000 kids. You know, get it done. And they do. Uh, and, and they don't do it alone, but they get the wheels in motion. And so couldn't, couldn't say enough good things about them. But what I'd like to do is present both with a certificate of appreciation but also mr jesse and this came from the state and it's a uh, it's a i guess a chef's hat with uh utensils on it and this is for uh, the outstanding job that he does as our director again uh we put a lot on their plate we give them a lot of last second uh edicts <laughs> or or you know just again it's it's one of those things but when it it leaves my plate and goes to theirs there's never a doubt that it's going to be done and it's going to be done right so again, we appreciate both of you and we appreciate all the ladies, but I appreciate your leadership as well. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Barton. Thank you, Mr. Jesse. Okay, now we want to start recognizing our ladies who put in the wheel and grind work too to keep everything going. First is Graham High School, Natalie Creasy, Donna Lawrence, and Brenda Phipps. Thank you all so much. <laughs> That's your eyes squint. That's how we know you're smiling. <laughs> Graham Middle, Eva Brown, Allison Dye. And let uh, Jewel Farmer, thank you, and Leslie Gerald. I smile. <laughs> Thank you all. And Taswell Middle, Marlena Cochran, Phyllis Davidson, Susan, oh, Susan Epperson, Georgia Smith, and Mary Van Hoosier. Thank you, ladies, so much. <laughs> Everybody smile. <laughs> Thank you all so much Thank for all your work. <laughs> Abs Valley Elementary, we have Kimberly Davis, Linda Dawson, and Eva Weaver. Thank you Thank all you. so much. Cedar Bluff Thank Elementary, you, we have Keisha Davis, Sandy Fuller, Annette Gilbert, and Terry Newberry. Dudley. Thank you all. Thank you. We have Deborah King, Edna Meadows, and Debbie Morrison. Thank you all. <laughs> Graham Intermediate, Dana Anderson, Teresa Kitts, and Sue Porter. Thank you. Congrats. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you all. Richlands Elementary. We have Kimberly Arms. Bicara Davis. Okay. Nettie Helbert. Anna Keen. Kiara Ray. And Crystal Street. Thank you. Okay. Huh? Just be. Okay. And from Taswell Intermediate, we have Gilsa Acres. These are not here. No, this is Taswell Intermediate. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I thought there wasn't. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. Jane Boardwine is present. Thank you, Jane. And we have Gilsa Acres, Kelly Gray, Barbara Ledford, and Regina Pruitt that are not present. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. <laughs> Now we have these. Okay, from Taswell Primary, we have Viola Kitts, so we know, as we know, the <laughs> Kitts, present and not present, but we appreciate Rita Baker, Tabitha Booth, Jenica Kaiser, Claire Patterson, and Tabitha Shortridge. Thank you, V. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Susan, you. are you taking the ones that are not here? Here's a stack. And ladies, let's give them all one additional big hand. Thank you all so much for all your work. And next, uh, Mr. McGee, we want to recognize our state champion wrestlers. This is a VHSL sport, and we had two state first place winners. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, Board Members, Dr. Stacy, Ms. Hill, Ms. Bailey. As hectic as our year has been, I'm very honored to introduce two of our student athletes tonight as state champions in wrestling. Justin Fritz of Graham High School won the state championship in the 182 pound class, and Josh Herndon of Taswell High School is the state champion in the 285 pound class. Justin, Josh. Yay! Can their Coach coaches Young. or principals come on up, please? Yes, ma'am. Coach Young couldn't be with us tonight. Okay. Uh, Mr. Smith is here for Coach Young. And Coach Fritz is here. For and Mr. Kitts Josh. is a four-time, is that right? Four-time state winner. And first time this Taswell High School has had a state wrestling champion. So, board members, y'all want to get your pictures? Well, 
That's what I keep saying. It leaves you. I'm going to not sit in the floor up here. At least it'll be on video. Look at it. Y'all think I'm going to What? This thing leaves when I get up. <laughs> I'm going to end up sitting down in the floor. And again, we're very proud of you. We, not often we get state champions, so we are very proud of you. Okay. Next, we have Cups and Conversations, Mrs. Welch. Finally. Madam Chair, school board members, Dr. Stacy, Mrs. Hill, Mrs. Bailey. In October, I received an email from our VDOE early childhood consultant, Donna Kirby. She said, I'm on a mission to encourage our outstanding VPI teachers in Southwest Virginia to share ideas and or strategies that have been successful in this time of COVID. The VDOE would like to feature them in a statewide cross-sector sharing forum called Cups and Conversations. As my visit to your classroom still stands out in my memory, as an example for others, I'm reaching out to you today. Thanks so much for considering this. I feel it would send the message to our BPI teachers that they are among the best in the state, as well as highlighting our programs. So on December 2nd, as I was home with COVID, three of our classrooms were featured in Cups and Conversations. The people here are the people that join me and they are they will join me this evening we'd like to do just a quick little presentation with you um, along with our teachers from three of our programs we also have our pre-k reading coach who helped who presented also i would like to mention that two of the teachers with me tonight have also been highlighted as tools of the mind twitter teachers of the month that is quite an honor as tools of the mind is used all over the nation and People upload their projects all the time, but we have had two of ours chosen. Um, they're going to share with you a small bit of their presentation. You have a copy there that you can look at, and as they come up, I'll let them uh, introduce themselves. Okay, at the beginning of the presentation, I just introduced my teachers and talked a little bit about our program, and then, oh. What did I do wrong? There we go. There we go. And gave an overview of what our county is like and you know our populations and what we deal with in Tazewell County. So that was our my part of the presentation, and then I turned it over to the experts who are here with me tonight. Ms. Boyd? Good evening. Thank you all so much for having us here. I'm Elizabeth Boyd and I'm the pre-K through third grade reading coach. Uh, my portion of the presentation was on class observation and professional development, which our pre-K teachers have embraced to the fullest. Uh, since 2018, we started dabbling into this um, concept of classroom assessment scoring system and it's a, a rigorous program, but our pre-K teachers, not only these, but all of them through the county have really embraced it to make sure that the interactions between the adults and the children in their room are of highest quality. After an observation is given, our teachers are given feedback. Our pre-K teachers use this feedback data as a lens by which to guide planning for the instructional programs and activities. And this includes our virtual uh, component this year as well. Strengthening the relationships will strengthen the learning and most importantly, a child's desire to learn. I appreciate the opportunity the board has provided for our pre-K teachers to be recognized. They are the true foundation of our educational system 
providing the keystone of learning for our most vulnerable and needy students. Thank you all for this opportunity for recognition for these well-deserved teachers. Thank you, Ms. Boyd. Hi, my name is Becky Spencer, and I'm a pre-K teacher at Dudley Primary School. Thank you for having us tonight. Um, my part of the presentation I dealt with the digital classroom, and I think this year was our first introduction into digital learning at the pre-K era, and uh, you can see that we transitioned from basically your traditional classroom there at the bottom to now I am literally sitting behind a laptop. Um, <clears throat> there are many ways that I was able to engage my preschoolers this year. Um, our Tools of the Mind program provides a virtual classroom with activities for the children and the parents to participate in. I use the Google Classroom format where I introduce Google Slides Boom cards, I use Cami. Those are all uh, things that I've been able to find success with. Our new reading series, World of Wonders, has um, online activities as well that you can si assign through the Clever program that go right along with the series that we're teaching, introduction of sounds, introduction of sight words, and vocabulary concepts. And all of these things um, that I've listed so far are sort of in the game format. Don't know if you spend any time with four-year-olds lately, but if you're not making it fun, go away. So um, those are way, the best ways that I've been able to interact with children. Um, if you see me making a video, I look like a complete idiot, but they are laughing and having a good time and learning something in the process. Mrs. Maupin, my principal, has graciously um, purchased the Reading Eggs and Math Seeds program for us this year, so my students have been able to log on there and work independently on pre-reading and pre-math skills as well. So that is another area <clears throat> that I've been able to help bridge the gap between home and at school in-person learning. Um, the last slide is, this year has been so challenging for everybody. It's not about the role, it's about the goal. The goal is I am the first window that any child will see coming into school. They've never been in a school setting before. And if I make it to where they look like that little fella on the left, they will not be successful learners the remainder of their time with Tazewell County Public Schools. Um, that's on me. So I need to make sure that the goal is more like what you see there on the first picture. Again, interactive, fun, get to know your families, get to know your children, know what motivates them, and that's what you'll see. Again, thank you for having me. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Lower this lower. Anybody else for you all to hear me? Hi, I'm Barbara Kinser. I'm the pre-K teacher at Tazewell Primary. Um, this is starting off on a different foot, and this is really what our entire year has been about: finding different ways to accomplish the same goals that we've had in previous uh, normal years, you would say. So this is a snapshot of pre-K orientation at Tazewell Primary in August. At this point, we didn't have devices to share with all of our families. And our younger students didn't even have Google accounts at this point. And we still needed to share information with families. So we had to find a way to do that. So we met outside in small groups. Uh, we were socially distanced and in some case masked up. Um, this has been our only face-to-face -face meeting that we've had with parents this year. And we didn't even get a chance to meet with children until they were dropped off on the first day of school. So it was really a different way to do things. Um, on top of that, pre-K teachers soon found out that the VDOE was still requiring us to account for learning time for students for five full days a week, even though we were only attending four shortened days a week. So parents were struggling with access to devices and to the internet, and later how to use Google Classroom. So we had to come up with a plan. 
Um, as pre-K teachers, we decided to make Wednesday learning boxes to help us to address this issue. As a team, we sat down with Mrs. Welch and Mrs. Boyd, and we made up a list of items that we wanted to be able to put in children's hands to promote engaged learning away from the school. So here we have the plastic shoebox with pencils, crayons, dry erase markers, erasers, um, glue stick, pencil sharpener, wiki sticks, and, and if you're not sure what a wiki stick is, my daughter asked me that this evening, it, it's a, a, a wax covered piece of yarn that you can form into different things. Uh, Play-Doh, dry erase board, lowercase capital letter cards, numeral cards, plain writing paper, and two new picture books. And as the year have gone, has gone on, some of us have added some new things to this box. We've added, in my classroom, we added um, uh, dice and some Play-Doh mats. We emphasized to the families before we sent these home with children that this box shouldn't be just left in the hands of the kids to play with, but instead used for a special learning time. So now, on Tuesdays, we've been able to send home a list of Wednesday work for the children that they can do alongside of an adult. And as the year has progressed, now that students have devices and most have access to the internet, we've also been able to include some Google Classroom um, assignments as well. But as a pre-K teacher, I know that learning happens best at this age with hands-on real-world experiences. So that's why we wanted to get these tools into our family's hands. Um, these will also be things that can carry over into summer. Um, I know everybody plans on sending home some suggestions on not having any summer loss, and things like this will help those families to keep that up and have the children ready for kindergarten. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amy Spencer, and I am the preschool special education teacher at Richlands Elementary School. So the first two ladies did a lovely job um, of saying what we're doing in our preschool program. So our part of the program was just to highlight the unique preschool program at Richlands Elementary School. So if you come to RES, we have two early childhood special education classrooms that are self-contained. Um, one VPI preschool classroom, and then our classroom, which is an inclusion VPI preschool classroom that we're pretty proud of. We have a lot of administrative support and it's just a big team effort um, and inclusion is a big word in the state as you guys know so we're really proud of that classroom um, and just the way that works. All students um, who will be four, year, four years old in the early childhood special education classrooms are given priority for the inclusion VPI classroom. The IEP team of course decides the best placement for those students. And on average at our school, 90 to 95% of our four-year-olds with IEPs are placed in our preschool inclusion classroom. Um, if for some reason that's not the best um, placement for a child, they're, also, they're included. They, they have some push-in time from our ECSC classrooms. Um, partner in crime. Hello, I'm Dawn Van Dyke, and as Amy says, we're partners in crime. I am the general ed teacher in our inclusion preschool classroom, and we are very, very proud of what we have accomplished in there. The staff in our inclusion preschool classroom includes a general education teacher, which is myself, an early childhood special education teacher that is duly licensed, that's Ms. Spencer. We are also blessed with a paraprofessional who is wonderful, Kami Van Dyke. We try to work as a team. We share our teaching responsibilities. We work together with planning. We do team teaching. We have small group instruction. We have parental contact that we've been very lucky to have used the Tools of the Mind Family Connect with. We also provide online instruction and Wednesday work as well. Our goal in our classroom is to work together so that if you walk into our classroom, you can't determine who the general education teacher is and who the special ed education teacher is as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I asked their principals to come with them so that way they could show that, you know, they support our program. And guys, if you haven't been in a pre-K classroom, 
at one of our schools, you're really missing it. That's where true learning <laughs> takes shape. Right, Dr. Stacy? That's it. <laughs> Would you all come up here and let's take your picture, please, the elementary? No, <laughs> you can. You all can. Thank you all. Thank you all. <laughs> okay. Next uh, is National Middle Education Month. Mr. Brown, Director of Middle School Education. Madam Chair, Madam Co-Chair, members of the board, Dr. Stacy, Ms. Hill, Ms. Bailey. March of this year has been designated as National Middle Level Education Month. For our three outstanding schools that educate middle school students in our county, they play a critical function for our educational system in that they are responsible for educating young adolescents between the ages of 10 and 15 that are undergoing rapid, dramatic changes in their physical, intellectual, social, emotional, and moral development. Serving close to 1,300 middle school students in our county, we've been able to provide, during the middle of the pandemic, safely and successful instruction for in-person for 800 of these kids this year. All the credit goes to our school staffs, as well as our parents, caregivers, who have admirably navigated life over the past 12 months and still provide students with a safe, challenging, supportive learning environment as well as the organizational structures that promote personalization, collaboration, and social equity. The habits and values established during these years have a critical lifelong influence that directly impacts the future health and welfare of our nation. Research has found that academic achievement of eighth grade students has a larger impact on their readiness for college by the end of their high school than anything that happens academically during high school. In order to keep improving our graduation rates, and prepare students to be lifelong learners ready for college, career, and citizenship, a deeper public understanding of the distinct mission of middle-level education is necessary. The Association for Middle-Level Education has joined the National Association for Secondary School Principals, the National Association of Elementary School Principals, to declare March as National Middle-Level Education Month and recognize the importance of middle-level education and honoring contributions to those who educate this unique age group. So I'd like to say thanks to our staffs and faculties at all of our middle schools, the job they've done. As we noticed, our cafeteria folks, they've been an integral part of our work the past 12 months. So I'd like to give a, a congratulations to all of our folks who have made this transition as smoothly as possible. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Brown. Absolutely correct. We, everybody's had to really step up. <laughs> Okay, I uh, did not have anyone to sign up for hearing of citizens, so we'll move on to hearing of employees. Is there any employee who would like to speak? Second call? <laughs> Third call? Okay. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. She's running. We'll hold off. 
<laughs> you don't have to run. We'll be okay. I wasn't going to say anything, but I just have to say that my children were so excited today because we went outside and played. Yeah. And it was the yeah. first time all year. And I said if we didn't go outside but for 10 minutes to jump up and down and dance that we were going to. But we got to play outside on the playground, and they were so thrilled. And I'm just, I just wanted to share that with you all. It was wonderful. That so is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And I have a little friend at my church, and I asked her how her week had gone, and that was her exciting part was that she gets to go to gym and actually do some gym, and they're going outside on the playground. So I, I agree. The kids are really excited about that. That's great. Thank you. Okay, we will. Okay. Okay, the public hearing is set for 7.15, and I have about four minutes, so we'll um, <laughs> have to go on and come back. <laughs> uh, we'll move on to the unfinished business of the proposed policy regulation for personnel early retirement incentive program. First read, Ms. Taylor. I'm going to let Dr. Stacy go ahead. And, uh, uh, that, that's fine. I don't care. Okay. Madam Chair, Madam Vice, Vice Chair, excuse me, board members, Ms. Hill and uh, Ms. Taylor and uh, Ms. Bailey. What you have in your packet this evening, last month we presented a first read um, for the GBO-R policy. And again, this is early retirement. And basically what, what the purpose is, as I stated last month, um, retiree benefits are getting to be an issue, not just in Tazewell County, but across the Commonwealth. Uh, retiree benefits are, are important, um, but they're expensive. And so each year we meet with our, uh, our insurance carriers, uh, attorneys, and those things. And one of the first things they ask is, are you going to continue offering uh, incentives to your uh, retirees? And we always say yes, that we very much would like so. Um, as we've stated the past several years, we are now self-insured. And so we incur a bigger part of the expense uh, for insurance, whether it's our, our working employees or our retirees. So over the past several years, um, we have increased the years of service required from 10 to 15 and then 15 to 20. And the purpose of this policy is to, again, increase that from 20 to 25 years of service. Um, but move the age limit or the age requirement back in line with a VRS early retirement, which is 50 years of age. And so when we looked at that in previous years when we made adjustments, there was usually a little grandfather period or a few years of, of notice. And so we would like to do that, and that's what I've included. That's the only difference you're going to see in this month's version versus last month's version is a five-year sliding scale. And so right now, as the policy is, we'll say that 75 is the magic number, and that number is at least 20 years of service with the age of 55. And so we're going to try to keep 75 as the magic number, but over the next five years, it can be a combination of age and years of service as long as you meet the requirements of at least 20 years of service and this year 55 years of age. And as you can see in the chart, it'll go from 20 years of service, age 55, to 21 years of service, age 54, 22 years of service, age 53, uh, 23 years of service, age 52, 24 years of service, age 51, and finally by 2026, it will be 25 years of service with at least a minimum age of 50 years old. Um, and again, the Virginia retirement system for those who are in plan A or group A, plan, uh, one. plan one, I'm sorry, plan one, which is most of the people who would be of age to retire at this time. Um, the Virginia retirement service still considers the retirement age of, as 65, but they will say if you, you can still get a full retirement with 30 years of service, as long as you're at least 50 years of age. So we're going to try to get in line with the Virginia retirement system as far as the age requirement, but we are going to move the years of service up to 25. And so again, tonight is just a first read. Just want to put that in your hands so that you can look at it. Yes, sir. Did we approve the first read? You did approve they the first read, it. but we we changed it. So it is the same policy. It would just have the five-year sliding scale built in. And so I'll defer to the board on that. Second ring as amended. Okay. Okay. Then, then I'm I am fine, Miss Taylor. Again, this has went through our insurance uh, consultant. It, it's been through the attorneys. Um, everybody, everything's on the up and up. It'll just be again. It will move uh, five years from now. The final uh, verdict, so to speak, will be that you have to have at least 25 years of service to retire and keep our insurance. 
Any other questions? Thank you. I make a motion that the Tasman County School Board approve proposed policy regulation GBO-R personnel early retirement incentive program mm -hmm. as a second read as amended. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? I think I'm going to Pardon? Second. Oh, okay. Okay, has been moved and seconded. Is there any questions, discussion? I'm just thankful that we are still considering our uh, retirees in our health insurance program. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. And, and again, each year when we have our discussions, and, and the insurance carriers are the first ones to say, are you sure you're going to allow people to retire? Uh, there are lots of industries and lots of, of uh, businesses. When you retire, you know, you walk out of the door, and that's that's when your benefits end. Uh, so we're we're proud that we can still continue to offer that. And again, we're trying to take care of the folks who have made Tazewell County home and made their career with us. Okay. Any yeah, other? All right. Uh, all in favor, say aye. Uh, all opposed, same sign. Okay. It is passed. Second read. It's now it is yes, time for the public hearing for the 2021-2022 budget. No one signed up to speak, but if anyone in the audience wishes to speak or make a comment, you may come and do so. Second call. Third and final call. Thank you. It's been moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Moved and seconded that the public hearing for the 2021-2022 budget be closed. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Okay. Thank you. We'll move on to new business. Um, we need to ratify a school board vote. We had one on February the 10th regarding a personnel approval. The poll vote was approved by the board members 5 to 0. Do we need to do these separately? Together? Okay. And the second poll vote was on February the 24th requesting permission for Dr. Stacy to talk to other boards and school districts about the possibility of seeking injunction or suing regarding Governor Northam's new executive order and to proceed as he deemed necessary. Governor Northam kept the attendance for high school sports at 250 while allowing quite literally every other outdoor activity to expand to 1,000. This poll vote was approved by board members 5 to 0. I make a motion that the table. Pardon? No, it's had two. That was a new sheet. Did I give my phone? No. Okay. I make a motion that the County School Board ratify the poll votes of February 10th and February 24th, 2021. Is there a second? I'll second that. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Beavers, approval of bids. Sorry about that. <laughs> Madam Chairman, Vice Chairman, School Board Members, Dr. Stacy, Ms. Seal. I can't hear you. Um, can you hear me? There you go. Okay, now you can hear me. I'm here to get permission to do the roof at Tazewell High School. Okay. We have the bid. You should have it in your packet. Mm -hmm. okay. The bid is for Denford Roofing yes, to complete the roof at Tazewell High School. Mm -hmm. Is there a motion? Make a motion that the Tazewell County School Board approve the roof bid 
for Tassel High School from Dunford Roofing in the amount of 149,000 in the bid for Dudley Primary Roof Top Units. Do we want to do those together? These are listed. We together. can. Okay. That's two units. That's heat and air conditioning units on the cafeteria. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, and the bid for Dudley Primary rooftop units from Southern Air in the amount of $14,285.89. Is there a second? I'll second it. Thank you. Any questions? I got one. Okay. I don't see how these go. So, there's only one roof on the Yes. Yes. Yeah. And there was a $10 difference between them. $10 difference on them. Yeah. $10.11. Right. Um, Southern Air. Um, which, where are we going with? Southern, Southern Air. They're $10 cheap. But we do all of our, our. You do the other work, the, the, the summit train. with train. Is it just because one is cheaper? That's why we're going well, with it. Well, Southern Air, they do, they put a lot of stuff, and they work do a lot of sub work for trains. Okay. So it's probably the as long. They work together a lot, don't they? Yeah. Train hire Southern Air do a lot of their subcontract work. Okay. Well, I trust Any other discussion? I'm sorry. I said I trust it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. Uh, uh, all opposed, same sign. Okay. We'll move on to permission to obtain bids for excavator and forklift, Mr. Beavers. Yes, ma'am. I'm asking permission to get an excavator and a new forklift, which will have to go out to bid. You're just asking to obtain the bids right now, yes. is that right? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Do I have a motion? Make a motion that the Tass County School Board give permission for Mr. Beavers to obtain bids for an excavator and a forklift. Second. Yes. I second that. Thank you. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. All opposed, same sign. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beavers, for all you do. Okay, permission to offer bus driver contracts to employees. Mr. Mullins. And this is not just to teachers, it's for to offer to teachers or other employees support staff, is that correct? Uh, when we originally talked about we did talk about to uh, to teachers and not necessarily a contract but a work agreement. A work agreement. Because a right. uh, contract Yes. We couldn't fully offer a contract for right. the BRS benefits. But to answer your question, yes, ma'am, it could be for an aid or anyone. Um, as long as they get their CDL, which Mr. Malls will take mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, as you said, we would like to offer this. We have several open routes at this time, and it's getting harder and harder to find drivers. Um, with a work agreement to... Uh, offer them steady routes steady pay i think it would be a good incentive they would still have to follow through with all the same stipulations that other drivers do as far as state regulations for a license uh, they would not be eligible for their benefits as vrs extra days off um, and they wouldn't be available for long extended contract times such as vocational or the um, special needs rents it would be just like a second job to give them a little bit of a second income if they so desired. But Correct. It'd be based off a 25-hour contract and in normal times, a 180-day contract. Their primary contract would be with their first job, whether it be teaching or an aide or whatever it might be. Correct. And we do have, Mr. Mullins, you correct me if I'm wrong, we have two individuals who are in this role now teaching yes. um, and working as drivers. But we've had as many as four or five at one time doing it and again principals work with those folks to make sure their schedule kind of aligns with bus uh, arrivals and departure times but it's it's an excellent way uh, for folks to make additional monies and they're coming to schools anyway and they're leaving schools at that time anyway so 
uh, what, what a great opportunity. And our experience has been that teacher bus drivers have already established excellent rapport uh, with students. Um, they've been through teacher education programs, classroom management cl uh, uh, experiences. And so usually um, they can make that transition quite smoothly and be very successful uh, in the dual role as, as either a teacher or an aide and a bus driver as well. Currently, they're being paid a substitute rate. Yes, sir. And this is going to be more than a substitute rate. This, this is going to be a full time, whatever mm -hmm. year, you know. Now, if someone comes to us with five years driving experience, obviously we would make that adjustment, but they would be on year one of our pay scale for, for drivers. The, the big thing is we can't offer a contract. Uh, the VRS will not allow you to have a professional and classified um, contract at the same time. So it, they would still be under their professional contract in relation to the teaching profession, but they could get the um, work agreement and collect full wages. I'm thrilled to death after so many years of being told we can't do this and figure out what can happen. Yes, sir. If I was a new teacher or a student of violence to pay off, I'd be jumping on that. Absolutely. Or if your teacher was somebody in college. Yeah. <laughs> or an employee was someone yeah. in college yeah. or something. I mean. Yeah. You know, many ways you could use that, I'm sure. And the luxury that we have now, Mr. Mullins is a trainer, so he can schedule the classes as needed, whether it's evenings, weekends. I don't know if he wants to give up all of his Saturdays, but he certainly <laughs> Saturdays might be a little bit. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be glad to work with him and uh, help get him up to speed and uh, get this program working because uh, every year we're getting them. Bigger shortage of drivers. Okay. Do I have a motion? I make a motion that the Tasman County School Board give permission for Mr. Mullins to offer bus drivers work agree bus driver work agreements to teachers and other employees. Okay. Is there a second? Do you second? Okay. Any discussion? Any further discussion? Or questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed same sign. Okay, Mr. Thank Mullins, you. permission to obtain bids for service trucks. Yes, uh, our service truck in Richlands area and our service truck in Tazewell area are 1999 models. <laughs> uh, we have been through the transmissions of these two trucks before. They're getting ready to uh, say goodbye again. We just uh, need to upgrade our 20 year old service trucks. Uh, we have looked at state bids. We're looking probably around $28,000, $29,000 each. Okay. That is not with the toolbox. That would be a great thing if you would allow us to look for that as part of the option. When well, the county bought maintenance trucks a while back, it's been quite a long time working with the county to see. They managed to get them with the school boxes on the back, and I think they got them from Mountaineer Ford and Benson, I think. But you might call over and ask where they got those. Okay. They, were, they were very nice. They, they were comparable with the state bid of a, of a regular um, straight truck in, in the beginning. I think as long as it's within the 5% or 10%, we can skirt that state bill to my Do you remember? There, there's a percentage. I'm not sure off the top of my head. There is a percentage that mm -hmm. you can skirt that, but I'm not, I can't say it off the top of my head. Yes, sir. Would you like for me to price both ways a straight bed truck and a toolbox truck and you know, bring those back to you next month? I'm just, this is just me talking, but if I'm if I'm the one to make a road call to work on a vehicle on the side of the road, I think I'd want the right vehicle to do that. You're correct. Instead of just throwing mm -hmm. a bunch of tools and back the truck to send around, mm -hmm. we're probably going to save money and set the car up long term to buy the right equipment to the end there. Does that, does that make sense? It does. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I will look at it with uh, two But boxes. while I'm on a roll here, <laughs> okay. how many. This might be something that you have to wait for next Monday too. How many uh, service trucks do we typically have out at one time on the road? How many at one time? Yeah. Usually it's just one, because typically our service trucks are only out 
when we have a vehicle breakdown right. or if we have an accident. And uh, we like to cut down on both of those. So it's uh, rarely more than one? It's rarely more than one? Rarely. So then the next question would be, what would, what would the difference in cost be in buying one new truck or buying no new truck and building a simple line bus truck? Long I would love to talk to you about a large garage. I mean, You'd love to out. what? I couldn't hear. I would love to talk to you about a, a large garage supervised, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't know when that'll be in our budget future. Uh, it's, it's worth a discussion amongst y'all before we commit to buying vehicles that are going to be around a long time. And this is just. One guy that I'm here in the table talk. Yeah. But that would also say personnel money too, wouldn't it? Well, as diverse as our county is, we still need several people available in the mornings and the evenings in case we do have a breakdown. Mm -hmm. So um, I think six mechanics. We still would need that that available and working shifts like we do now. And that way, if, if we had something to happen in Richlands area and something to happen in that Valley area at the same time, we wouldn't want to be shorthanded and couldn't go to a call. We we'll still need two trucks. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think of course there's another item on here uh, later on to talk about facilities, but I think right now. You know, all the planning in the world, we're still years away from constructing, um, whether it's a school or a, a centralized bus garage, we're still years away from that process. So I'm not sure that, that at this time we could hold off on trying to get a couple of trucks, but I understand your sentiment on, on a central location. Okay, I need a motion as to what we want to do about the bids for service trucks. Make a motion that the Tazewell County School Board give permission for Mr. Mullins to obtain bids for service trucks. Do we want service trucks with toolboxes or just service trucks? Tell you what, I'll price it both ways. Okay. Yes. And then when I bring it back to you, and uh, okay. we can make a sound decision at that time. Okay. Is there I'll a second it. to the motion then? I'll second it. Any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Okay. Mr. Mullins, you're still up. Yeah. <laughs> Support for the electric school bus program. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, we I got him. We're going to keep him. I think it's Vicki Bailey's fault. She She's hiding. She's hiding over there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so last, uh, last month I, I gave it away that I've been talking about electric buses. Uh, part of the... Uh, Clean Virginia Act, and they are also in partnership with uh, Mid-Atlantic Electric Bus. Uh, since I was last here, I've actually got a, a few more contacts from uh, Virginia Clean Cities, and they're excited to try to bring in a rural county such as Tazewell. They do not have the data they need to move forward with rural counties. Everything they've done so far has been in the uh, cities so um, I'm asking for your support to move forward with that I don't know if we would be in the 21-22 year or the 22-23 but uh, my indications from what I'm, what I'm being chased I think that would be this coming school year okay. we'd have opportunity to, to test these buses for eight weeks give our input and also uh, see how they work in our area. I mean, there's a mm -hmm. lot of questions because of our terrain. I think that's exciting. It'll save air buses for a little while there too. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. So it'll take a few miles off ours. That's right. And we'll run these. I, and I plan, I, I've talked to the mechanics, uh, we'll have one centralized charging station, but uh, I want to try it out in each area. Mm -hmm. Richlands, I'll try it in Tazel. Mm -hmm. and Bluefield 
And let's see if it can make it to Ed's Valley and back. Do you know how many buses you will have to try them? Hopefully two. Okay, great. Two. Okay. And if you look at the uh, the Julie, that's that's the one I request, and it's on a Freightliner thing. Hmm. So they do allow us to ask about different manufacturers. And, uh, those uh, drivetrains is made in Canada. Huh. So. Okay. Do I have a motion? Make a motion that the Chancellor County School Board approve the participation of Chancellor County Public Schools in the electric school bus program. Is there a second? Thank you. Any other discussion? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It will well, be exciting to see that and see how they work. That'll be good. Well, if we get this, I think that I should uh, take you all the board members for yeah. <laughs> Okay. And I'll follow behind you in the car just in case. <laughs> how about a tow truck? In case yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. All in favor of the elect supporting the electric school bus program, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Okay, and Mr. Mullins joined by Ms. Beavers yes, for the uh, commission to obtain bids <laughs> bus radio. Uh, Ms. Mullins, I, I know that you know our dire need for radios too, 20 some year old radio system. Yes. <laughs> uh, with students in Aminata, oh, yes. Tannersville, Ads Valley, it's better than it used to be. They put another tower in there. Yeah. Uh, we would like to talk to you about radios, and, and Ms. Beavers has actually been doing some work as far as looking at pricing. Good. Good evening. We have been talking with uh, one of the vendors, actually the vendor that we used for our school radio project year before last or last fall. Uh, the radios that we are proposing would work in conjunction with the system that we have. Um, and they have the same guidelines as if they would uh, be able to be monitored by 911 as well. So if there is an issue, um, they could get help immediately. Um, we have, like I said, we've done some preliminary work and it looks like it's going to run somewhere around $243,000, um, but we do have to go out to bid and so that tonight we're asking for your permission for us to go out to bid to get the best price, uh, but to get the system that will work in conjunction with the systems that we already have in the schools. I think this is exciting. As Mr. Mullen said, when I was the administrator, it was there were many times it was very difficult to get a hold of a bus. And when you have a missing child and a parent who's wondering where their child is, it's, it's an emergency to get a hold of that bus. <laughs> and that's one of the things that Mr. Holt, Ron Holt, the Sheriff's Department, and the town police have talked about too, is, is the safety issue. Mm -hmm. Because there are areas of the county that uh, you, you can be out of communication with. Mm -hmm. And the thing, and I, I don't know if Mr. Mullen said this tonight, but we've said it before, our radio system is such that you can't replace just one area or one school. Right. You have to do the entire division and all buses at one time. Right. Uh, you can't piecemeal them together. <laughs> so that's why we're looking to go out for this bid now. Okay. Do I have a motion? Make a motion to give permission for Mrs. Beavers and Mr. Mullins to obtain bids for bus radios. Is there a second? I've been fussing about that radio of North Tadwater and Tadwater Media and what have we talked about for 15 years. <laughs> Are you seconding? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other discussion? Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, all opposed, same sign. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you both and all your work. Equity in Education. This is Equity in Education Month. Ms. Hill. Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, School Board Members, Dr. Stacey, Ms. Bailey, uh, we would like to show a, a short video clip from VSBA supporting equity in education. Um, we'll look at the screen there. As Ms. Mullins stated, it is uh, Equity in Education Month in Virginia. Hello, I'm Janet Turner Giles, President of the Virginia School Board Association. And for the second year, March has been declared as VSBA Equity in Education Month. School board members, superintendent, teachers, and families can play a critical role in creating a climate 
and curriculum where all students receive the resources they need so they can graduate prepared for success after high school. Equity in education is a significant problem nationwide. According to the National Center for Educational Statistics, in 2017, the majority of public school students were students of color, and more than half of public school students qualify for subsidized meals due to low family income. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the challenges that our students face each day, including access to meals, internet connectivity, and the support of an adult outside of the school building. These are just some of the challenges that all school boards must consider when ensuring an equitable education is available for all students. When inequity in education persists, there is a cost to all including missed opportunities for economic development, greater dependence on government supports, and fewer Americans ready to serve and lead. Please join me and school board members across the Commonwealth to highlight the importance of equity in education. We must all work together to ensure that all of our students receive the supports and resources they need to be successful. Thank you. And I would like to note Tazewell County Public Schools uh, supports equity in education. Yes. Thank you. And that equity can be in many forms, whether it's socioeconomic, as Ms. <coughs> Janet Turner Niles mentioned there, or in many fashions and the equity in education, and we do. Okay, uh, Dr. Stacy, permission to obtain bids for legal services. Yes, ma'am, Madam Chair, Madam, Madam Vice Chair, School Board members, Ms. Hill, Ms. Bailey. Uh, what I'd ask tonight is permission to go out to bid for uh, legal services. As you know, we have a very good relationship with our Board of Supervisors, and we have been utilizing the uh, county uh, attorney. Uh, in the past, it was Mr. Eric Young, and it's currently Mr. Chase Collins. But there are times that we will need outside legal counsel, um, and we hope that the Board of Supervisors will allow us to continue using Mr. Young or whoever the county attorney would happen to be. Um, but again, there will be times that we will need outside legal counsel. Uh, the last time we went out to bid was five years ago, and so through procurement uh, processes, we need to do that every five years. So I'm, this has nothing to do. We've been very happy with Botkin Rose, um, but it's just time to go out to bid again uh, seeking the legal services. Do I have a motion? Make a motion to give permission for Dr. Stacy to obtain bids for legal services. I'll second it. Okay. Any discussion? A little bit. I'm, okay. I'm very happy with Bach and Gregory for making sure that he met us through some big issues and little mm -hmm. and the like. Um, and when, when we came to the agreement with the Board of Supervisors uh, for Mr. Young, there were two county attorneys mm -hmm. and a county administrator. And they're kind of stretched thin these days, and I would rather see us go more with Bach and Grove or whoever we end up going with. I hope we stay with Bach and Grove, they've been wonderful by us, than switch back and forth. If that makes sense. I'm mm -hmm. staying with one that, that knows our system and has grown to know everything going on, rather than switching back and forth. Um, We'll leave somebody eventually out of it. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good point. Is there a motion that would go allow him to go to bed? No, we don't. We're done. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I got distracted. Sorry, I was on comments, wasn't I? <laughs> sorry. Mm -hmm. I was thinking the head there. Never mind. Okay. I'll, in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, I'll oppose, same sign. Okay. Okay. Continue on, Dr. Stacy. Next. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, end of the year information. Um, today is the 130th day of, uh, of education. It's it's hard to believe it's been a long year, but at the same time, uh, we looked today and I thought, wow, 130 days. It, it's hard to believe that we're here. Um, coming up on the one year anniversary of March the 13th, Friday the 13th of all days. 
uh, when when everything kind of stopped for us last year. So to think that we have been um, in the school year for 130 days, and again, that's, that's included some virtual days and some remote learning days, but uh, it, it's pretty exciting to think that, that we're here. And uh, as the school year starts winding down, I'd like the board this evening to uh, allow me to set a few dates. Um, the first thing I would like to do is ask for permission to uh, set graduation for Tazewell County. Um, and actually would like to do a little bit uh, unique this year. Talk to the principals. Um, we are probably still going to be under some restrictions from the governor. I think that our graduations are going to have to be outdoors uh, like they were last year. So talking to the principals, they've asked for permission to either schedule gra uh, graduation on Friday evening, May the 28th, or Saturday morning, May the 29th. And again, that gives them two days to um, play with the weather, so to speak. And so again, I think all indications are going to be that we're going to have to do outdoor graduations. Now, I am hopeful that um, the governor will um, loosen the restrictions uh, before we get to this time. Right now, graduation would be under the same guidance as a high school football game, 250 um, participants or, or spectators. So we're hoping that by the time we get to that point, it will be a little a little more uh, less restrictive. But I think that we're going to have to be with the uh, outdoor graduations. So again, I know we traditionally set one day countywide, but the principals would like to have the, the flexibility to either have a Friday evening graduation. And again, there's something to be said about the uh, atmosphere, the ambiance of uh, sunsets and, and those things in some of the stadiums. But uh, those of us who attended a Saturday morning graduation last year were pretty impressed and pretty pleased with the uh, with the outcome. So again, um, I would defer to the board. But those are I would like to ask for both dates. But if you would would you at least give us one, um, I think that's the will of the administration as well. What about the last day of school? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, last day of school, as you know, uh, and and I'll say this again, and I'll I'll. Uh, not pat myself on the back, but pat our teachers and our students and our teachers and faculty, everybody in our buildings. Uh, we've been in school about as long as anybody in the Commonwealth. Um, when Miss Hill submitted our back to school plan, we were very clear about our criteria and what all we plan to do. And I think for the most part, we've done about what we said we were going to do. But one of the things that we said was that we were going to acknowledge a learning gap um, possibility and how would we uh, attack that learning gap. And so one of our ideas was to increase our instructional year to 190 days. And so when our plan was approved, that of course could include the virtual days that we've done this year. But anyway, to get us to the 190 days and meet the criteria for our back to school plan, I'm asking that the school board set the last day of school for students to be June the 3rd and our teacher work day to be June the 4th. And I think that's a Thursday and Friday. Do I have a motion? Make a motion to approve May 28th and 29th as graduation dates and June 3rd as the last day of school with June 4th being a teacher work day. Is there a second? That? Any discussion? No. Sorry. Madam Chair, I don't yes. know if we would need to amend the motion for it. First of all, having a choice between Friday night and Saturday morning I think it's a great idea and should not end with a pandemic year but carry forward um, because that Saturday morning was uh, wonderful that you and, and, and Mr. It was. Robbins and I were in Bluefield and it, it was a great experience and there wasn't that I heard a negative word said. Um, but also um, that would put Graham graduating across the state line and we would have to secure that stadium. Um, I think it would behoove us also to extend that offer to the other two schools in the event that we're still under 250 people to say, hey, if that's not enough, we've got a stadium across the state line that you can use as well. Yes, sir. And I will, uh, once the, the dates are approved, I will work along with Mr. Carr and Mr. McGee. We will um, work with the city of Bluefield, West Virginia to, to uh, procure the stadium. Any other work, what? Yeah. I think most people they want to graduate at their home school and 
that it would be good, it would be nice to offer, I guess. Any other discussion? Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Okay. Dr. Stacy. Yes, ma'am. Madam Chair, we have talked uh, over the years. Um, and, and, and first off, I will say that our buildings, I would put our facilities up against anyone. Um, when you walk in our buildings, you tend to forget how old they actually are. Uh, our buildings are clean, well kept, uh, and, and something to be proud of. But that being said, um, we still have buildings that were constructed in the 1930s. Uh, Dudley Primary was a 1937 construction. Taswell Intermediate School was a 1932 uh, construction. And again, there's been some additions to those facilities, but the base unit is, is 1930s construction. Um, our newest, uh, uh, brand, brand new building is Graham Middle School. And while I tend to act like the 1980s were just a few years ago, they weren't. <laughs> um, Graham Middle School, the newest constructed facility in Tazewell County Public Schools is 40 years old. It's a 1981 construction. And of course, our other middle schools were, Tazewell Middle's a 1980, and Richlands Middle's a 1976. Um, Looking at enrollment trends, in 1991, there were 8,760 students in Tazewell County Public Schools. Ten years later, there were 6,986 students. Ten years later, in 2011, there were 6,397 students. And as of this morning, Tazewell County Schools in 2021 has 5,290 students. So the decline in enrollment uh, is certainly something to look at. The age of our facilities is something to look at. Um, again, I was going to say, you know, the internet wasn't thought of in the 30s, but it, it wasn't in the 80s either, at least, you know, in the school <laughs> system here. So um, lots of times, and again, as, as proud as we are of our facilities, sometimes when Miss Beavers or someone else is coming up here to talk about technology, our solid construction works against us at times. Uh, it, it makes connectivity, Wi-Fi, those things really uh, – cumbersome and again the technology staff does an excellent job of making these things work but also when we start looking at um, modern construction you take into account technology you take into account um, safety those things sometimes our buildings are not designed for visitors to be secured in one area before they have access to the main school so we do a great job again locking our doors and making sure there's somebody to man those doors but lots of times newer facilities there's a there's a door there that, that keeps them from the main area. There's a holding area, so to speak. So I think when you start looking at new facilities, there's lots of different um, things where we could really enhance our instructional delivery. Um, I will say this too. I'm asking you for to allow me to go out to bed to, look, to do a facility study. Um, but before anyone gets their uh, upset or gets uptight about this, <laughs> This is in no way means we're ready to close the school, that we're ready to consolidate the school. It's nothing like that. I just think, um, and, and those of us who are on the tail end of our career, we may not be around to, uh, to see any of this. But if we had a pile of money today, we would still probably be five or ten years away from, from starting construction. Uh, by the time you start looking at studies to decide where things would be, um, the, the enrollment, what size schools you would build, or any of those things. But I think we owe it to future generations of Tazewell County school students, um, administrators, school boards. Um, I think we at least need to start the talks about what, what Tazewell County schools will look like 20 years, 30 years, 50 years down the road. Um, and again, I think these facilities will still be here. I just don't know that they'll be utilized in the same capacity. So again, I'm just asking for permission so that we can at least get some studies done that would give us some guidance and some some baseline talks or baseline to start our talks with. But again, we're we're years away from actually being able to do anything. I will say that the the Commonwealth of Virginia, it, Southwest Virginia is not not the only ones. It, it's across the Commonwealth. Schools are dated, and if you're not in Northern Virginia, it's hard to build a school. It's hard to build a, uh, construct any kind of facility. So. They are starting to listen. When I say they, I'm talking about legislators. And they're starting to make monies available. Now, there'll still be a local buy-in, a local contribution, a local match. 
but they have started to talk about uh, allocating money for the sole purpose of school const school construction, school updates, and those things. So I would like to have some experts, so to speak, come in, look at our uh, trends. And we don't have census data yet, but we will for the countywide. But our our Tazewell County Public School Census shows that every 10 years we're seeing a notable decline uh, in enrollment. So I'm hopeful that with us, and this is another item on the agenda down the line, but with our you know hopeful uh, online offerings and things like that, our numbers will stabilize some. But I don't, I'm not prepared to say how much. So that that is what I'm asking for this evening. Plus, the study itself will take some time. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Again, that, I don't want people to think that we're going to roll in and, and start anything, but. If we don't start now, right. um, future boards, future superintendents, somebody eventually is going to have to start the discussion, and I think that we should be the ones to start this. Um, okay. I watched a webinar the other day about school construction, and this is exactly what they suggested. Even if you're not planning to build a school tomorrow, you need to have a plan or a study done so you kind of have your head wrapped around the details. Yes, ma'am. And I think you can look at the histories. You know, the high schools were primarily built in the 50s and 60s. The middle school started in the 70s and were finished in the early 80s. And I think at the time the thought was, well, well, we'll circle back then and immediately begin planning for new elementaries. Um, the economy was not at such that, that folks could do that at that time. So our new school construction pretty much stopped in 1981. And again, our facilities are excellent. I'm not saying anything like that. I just think we need to start planning for, again, what Tazewell County will look like 10, 20 years down the road. Do I have a motion? Make a motion that we give approval for Dr. Stacy to obtain bids for a facility study. Is there a second? I'll make it. I'll second. Okay. Discussion? Discussion? What? Chris got the order back. Okay. All in favor say aye, please. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Okay. Ms. Whittington, if you would give us an update on Linwood Holton Governor School, please. Uh -huh. I'm not sure a lot of people are aware that we have kind of a hidden gem uh, in our region as far as the A. Linwood Holton Governor School. Uh, it's one of 19 academic year governor schools in the Commonwealth. It serves 17 school divisions and 36 high schools, primarily in far southwest Virginia. It is a virtual school and is a typical year. The student takes the classes from an online lab at their home high school. The classes and expectations are designed for academically motivated and successful students. The goal is for the coursework to complement and not replace any courses offered at the student's home high school. The current year enrollment is 404 students, with most of these students being juniors and seniors. We do have some high-achieving sophomores enroll each year as well. The school offers both synchronous, which would be live classes, and asynchronous courses, and offers a wide variety of classes for students to choose from. When possible, students are encouraged to take more than just one class with the governor's school. One area that we take pride in is helping students prepare for college. Not only are the teachers content specialists, but they work to teach students how to study, problem solve, and or write for college level courses. And this coming year, we're excited to be adding a part-time student success specialist next year and hope that this position will allow us to grow the opportunities for college preparation and are off, that are offered in the future. And the primary responsibilities of this uh, position would be to support students who are struggling academically, developing an ACT, SAT prep program, and developing college success strategies. All the classes are dual enrollment except for the Latin 1, 2, and 3. Latin is high school credit only. The dual enrollment credit for Tassel County students taking classes is given through Southwest Virginia Community College. The cost to students for our courses is zero. 
does not cost the student, the family, anything. The local school division share of the cost is by far the lowest of any academic year. Governor's School in Virginia at $200 per student. And this has been, we've had it at 500 in the past and now it's uh, down to 200 as the school's contribution, the school division. For the $200, the school, the school can sign up the student for as many classes as they qualify for and want to take each year. So that's just, that's not $200 per course, that's $200 for as many courses as they want to take during the year. It's a great opportunity, it is dual enrollment classes. Um, there are a lot of different uh, classes that are offered, cybersecurity, creative writing, uh, there is environmental science, human anatomy and physiology, and as I said, Latin, principles of physics, probability and statistics, Western civilization, world civilization, among other classes. So there are a lot of offerings, and you can take it from your school, or if you want to do it asynchronous, you can actually work on it from your home, just like our other online classes, but it is a dual enrollment class. And uh, I shared with the other board members, we have uh, kind of a breakdown of how many uh, students per division. And, you know, we'd like to see more participation from our students. I don't know if it's because they don't know about this opportunity, that it is available, but, uh, you know, there are students out there who are interested to talk to your uh, guidance counselor to let us know if you are interested. Uh, one thing that I found interesting at our last board meeting was that uh, during the 2020-21 school year, as far as dual, uh, dual enrollment, the total college credits, there were 3,574 college credits that were obtained this year through the governor's school. And we have divisions who have as many as uh, 82 students in their division participating. <clears throat> we have seven. We'd like to see that number. It's a great opportunity. We'd like to be able to see more students uh, get involved in this and take advantage of this opportunity. Thank you. I also noticed there was an Appalachian history yes. offered for them. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that would be interesting for a lot of students who like history. Uh, can I add this uh, yes, month's please. edition of Virginia Living Magazine recognized uh, Linwood Holton Governor School along with Virginia Virtual as two uh, outstanding educational platforms in the state of Virginia. So it's quite an honor to be recognized. Great. That's Mr. good. Madam Chair, yes, sir. I, I just want to throw in there, um, wow. our, write, write this down mm -hmm. to me, our enrollment in this school is abysmal and it's embarrassing. I'm embarrassed mm -hmm. by it. I was on that board before Ms. Whittington took it and that this school's always held a special place in my heart. There's no reason, the size we are, that we don't have 10 times the number of students enrolled that we currently have. These kids work side by side virtually with <coughs> researchers from Harvard, with engineers from NASA, mm -hmm. with, with, uh, with all kinds of people and experiences that, that we could never offer <coughs> in our schools, that virtual Virginia could never offer, and um, that other one, what is it? Virginia's virtual. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we have to get these numbers up because we're going to disservice our own student mm -hmm. by not by not getting them enrolled in a room we're holding down in school. Uh, so I hope when we have this report a year from now that that number is much larger than it is right now. Because we're, we're one of the largest counties in the system and have one of the smallest numbers. That's embarrassing. I agree. I know at one time, I think it's still kind of perceived this way that there used to be that zero period first thing in the day where they had to be there at 7 o'clock in the morning. And, you know, the high school kids don't want to do that. They don't want to be at school and have to be in front of a computer. But now, it's not like that now. I mean, they can take it. A lot of it is set up on a block schedule, but they can take these classes 
either at their school during that scheduled time for the class or they can do it at home on the weekend and be able to take the classes and you know it's a great opportunity to not only get these classes but also to have the dual enrollment to get college credit for it anyone who has helped to put a student through college should really think about what an advantage this would be for students to take advantage of these dual enrollment credits mm -hmm. Uh, I think maybe our guidance counselors at the high school levels need a refresher on what's available through there and to really help our students and our families, our parents know that this is available because that's a big advantage for students to go into college from graduation with college credits as well as saving the money, family, a lot of money. And be much better prepared mm -hmm. classes than right. them. Yeah. And we'd be happy to, um, you know, have Mr. Robinson, Mike Robinson, to, you know, meet with guidance counselors or however you would like to utilize his services. I'm sure he'd be more than happy to come. Well, with Zoom, you can certainly yes. set up a, a short Zoom meeting, of, you know, an hour out of their day or something. That's good. Thank you. Very much. Mr. Mr. Woodard, you have a legis legislative update. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> the legislative session and the special session are both over, and some good things passed, and some not so good things passed, and um, we'll see changes next year that are uh, mandated by the legislature, and, and uh, uh, don't blame us on some of them. <laughs> Uh, but the key thing as far as VSBA's legislative uh, uh, positions committee goes is June the 7th, and most all of you got an email from VSBA on my behalf today, June the 7th is the deadline for legislative proposals to the Green School Association. So if we have any ideas to toss in, then um, they need to be put in the format of their forms and inmates in order to fill out. Um, and it has to come from the school board, so it would have to be at least by the main meeting that we adopt them and send them to them. Okay. And that ultimately ends up in the delegate assemblies. Um, did y'all do the survey on, on annual convention? I did. Whether we want to be in person or not. I did. When did that come up? Uh, it was a week or so ago. It's over now. Okay. Um, we were going to meet and discuss it this morning and um, take the time until April. And I think we have to make a decision by May. Okay. So I don't know what's happening, but the delegate assembly, uh, good chance it'll be virtual regardless. I don't know. Anything else? Mr. Witter? Oh, I've got plenty to come later on. Not for this legislation. But. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll move to superintendent's report, school health services. Can you see in here? She is. She's good. Oh, I can't see her behind <laughs> the speaker. Hi, <laughs> school board members. Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, Dr. Stacy, Ms. Hill, Ms. Bates. I'm just going to give a couple updates. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So right now we have five positive cases in the county. Four are students, one is staff. 59 are quarantined, 52 are students, seven are staff. That's as of today. Some updates on the vaccinations. The VDH has completed our mass vaccination um, clinics. We still do have some um, individuals that are getting vaccinated. Um, we have had approximately 750 employees sign up to be vaccinated. And as of the end of this week, March 11th, um, about 99% of those will be fully vaccinated. So that will be two weeks post their second vaccine. So the CDC and the VDH um, have now said that if you are exposed to COVID, if you are two weeks past or post your second vaccine, you will not have to quarantine. 
So that's kind of good news. Mm -hmm. You do have to be asymptomatic, and it does have to be within the last three months. Those that want to be vaccinated, you can still sign up for um, a vaccine clinic. And I just want to kind of, um, I had a few people ask me about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and um, I spoke to the health department about this. It is something they're working on obtaining. It should be sometime soon um, if they know that they're going to actually obtain these vaccines. And if they do, they're going, um, they're planning a clinic. But they just do not have um, that information or it's not concrete right now because they have to make sure they're going to get these vaccines. But it is something that may be available very soon. If it is, I will put something out there to employees. That's about it. Any questions for me? I've got a question, and I don't mean to put you on the spot. And, okay. and if you don't know, that's perfectly fine. Uh, I had a question asked if someone received the first dose, mm -hmm. and then for whatever reason they can't attend that second dose, what is the time period? Uh, let's say 28 days they're scheduled to go, and, and they, they have to miss that day or they can't go. What What's the time period that they should receive that second dose in and still be effective? Do you know that? Yes, it should be 42 days. 42 within 42 days. days, the second vaccine. Okay. okay. Within the 42 days. The second one um, needs to be scheduled after 28 days from the first, mm -hmm. but within 42 days. Of the, of the first, first dose. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Anyone? There are pharmacies um, in Singleton and the region who have the Johnson Johnson now. Okay. If we have anybody that wants that. Okay. They just might have to drive a little bit to get to it. Okay. <laughs> they should be maybe getting that out to the community this month where it was um, authorized. So. so, yeah, if you want it, you may want to check with your pharmacy. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank you so much. We appreciate all your work. I know this yeah. has been a very difficult year in many ways. <laughs> Thank you. Her first year. Way, way to, uh, oh, no. perfect time. <laughs> Bless her heart. Came in right on the <laughs> pandemic. Here we go. Ms. Cox, good to see you. Budget update. Good evening. Um, for the budget update, I would just like to say that the current school year, everything's looking really good. And um, we're expecting to have a carryover for this year. And um, our goal is to... Um, give a 5% increase in the salaries and wages for the 2021-2022 school year. And um, we're waiting on the latest calculation tools for the governor's budget. So when we get those in, then we'll be able to kind of, you know, have a better idea of what we're looking at. And um, we're hoping maybe to get that by Wednesday, maybe the middle of this week. And um, I'm just looking forward to this year's budget process and working with all of you and Dr. Stacy. And as Ms. Cox said, you know, the governor right now has proposed a 5% raise over the biennium. Um, our goal would be to do a full 5% at the start of the next school year. Again, once we get our CALP tool and we see what local contributions we need, um, we'll have a much better idea, but that's our starting point. That's where we would like to go to begin the year. Obviously, we'll we'll make adjustments as needed. Um, again, we're gonna have some budget committee meetings with you folks. Um, right now, until we get our CALP tools and really see what our LCI is, um, we can estimate, but it's much better to see what the actual numbers are from the state. So I, I think, um, you know, early indications are the sales tax numbers from the Commonwealth and the county are better than than were feared last year i mean last year we thought you know the sky was falling uh, at times it literally seemed that way but uh, financially it seems that that it might not be as bad as originally forecasted so once we get our cap tools from the state we can see what the uh, local contribution are is what our contribution would need to be then i think we'll be uh, better better prepared to have some budget meetings uh, with board members board committee is that is that including excluding or in addition to a step i'm sorry my goal would be five percent plus a step uh that that's the starting point and again uh looking at the biennium you can do lots of uh different things at times to meet governor's mandates to receive the state funding our um, our step traditionally counts as almost a percentage 
And so um, it, it sometimes if you're at the top of the scale, you may not see the step raise or our first five steps are the, are the same. So there's a group in there that may not see that extra percentage raise traditionally, but our goal this year would be 5% plus the step. And again, we will start working backwards as funds dictate. That's another point is we need to, we need to at some point be committed to get rid of all those zero steps that were inadvertently put in there. I mean, we didn't, the board didn't know they were being added in when we were taking steps away however many years ago with, with another HR director. Yes, sir. Yeah. And, and again, I don't you, know when we can bite that. But. And, and it would be an expense because basically what you're going to say is certain folks are going to get two steps within that year to reduce that. Um, but again, those of us old folks, you know, when we got hired, the top of the scale was 20, 19 or 20. And then it, then it was added. And then now our top of our scale is, you know, 27. And so that, that's a big difference. And so. Most of us from all those zero steps got put Yes, sir. In. Yes, sir. Yeah. And so um, that's. Um, that's my goal always is to at least do the step and never, you know, elongate the schedule. But, um, yeah, we'll certainly have to look at that. I, I will say I don't think that this budget year is going to be the year to do that, um, unfortunately. Any other questions, Ms. Cox? Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for all you do. And she may have helped make your all's eggs tonight. I don't know. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> oh, Stacy, can I just clarify when you asked me about the days in between? I just want to clarify that that's for the Moderna vaccine, yes, which is what Tazewell County What our employees do. But there's also a Pfizer vaccine, which is 21 days in between after that first dose and then 35 days before the second. We did not receive that, but I know the health department is giving that. So they may have, the employees that are signing up now, they may have received that Pfizer vaccine. Okay. So I just wanted to clarify that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. CARES Act update, Ms. Hill. Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, Board Members. Uh, the only CARES update I have this evening is uh, we are currently in the process of writing a grant for the ESSER Funds 2 that is due by April 1st. So there's another round of CARES money there. Good. And that's, we are currently in that process. And Miss Hill's been working. Mr. Beavers, I don't know if Mr. Beavers is still here, uh, have been working to look at a big part of this this CARES money or, or um, air quality. yeah is going to be air quality. And so we've been looking at HVAC, and I'll I'll butcher this, but bipolar ionization. Yeah, it's bipolar, and that, that still throws me. But bipolar ionization <laughs> uh, to look at doing that in every device. And again, the technology with that is that it kills COVID or helps to really eliminate a large percentage of that, but not only COVID, but flu bugs, threat bugs, you know, everything like that. So that that's a priority is HVAC and, and air quality in this next round of CARES funding. That would be great. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Ms. Hill, insurance. Um, on the health insurance update, the RFPs were received and opened at central office on February 25th, 2021. Uh, Mr. Sam Irby with Innovative Insurance is currently putting together a report of all the responders and that will be presented to the budget committee hopefully next week okay and then the health insurance committee mm -hmm. okay. thank you any questions about the intern how many people did we have send apply or send an RFP well it depends we had 11 I believe but they all weren't the whole thing like okay. you might have had a dental but there were 11 packages 11 okay. responders just um, curious. I just yes. wondered how many had responded. That's what, um, like I said, so one of them might have been vision, one might have been dental, but we had 11 responders. Okay, good. Okay, virtual school update, Dr. Stacy. Uh, yes, ma'am. Last week, last Wednesday evening, Ms. Mullins and I attended a virtual meeting of the Regional Online uh, Academy. And, you know, when this idea first started across the region, the Tazewell County was, was no different than other school, other school systems in the Commonwealth. Our teachers were uh, inundated with work and extra work and additional responsibilities, teaching both in-person learners and, and online learners. So as a region, we started looking at what we could do to alleviate this. And our thought was to create our own online school. Well, Region 7 is a big region from you know Radford, Virginia, all the way to Lee County, covers a lot of miles. 
And so when we started looking at the number of students who were online in Region 7 alone, it was over 15,000 students. And so we, we are uh, sometimes a cocky group, but we weren't that cocky. We knew we couldn't <laughs> uh, put that together in a short time frame. So as, as word started to spread that the region was looking at creating its own school, lots of vendors started coming to us and saying, hey, don't recreate the wheel. We're already doing this. Why don't you partner with us? So last week at this uh, regional meeting, the board, of which Ms. Mullins is a member, um, voted that we would extend, uh, we would begin negotiating with three vendors, uh, Virtual Virginia, Virginia Virtual, and Edgenuity, uh, and Edmonton, they, they're one and the same. And so some divisions have, have uh, they like one better than the other. Uh, but what we've decided as a region is to uh, begin negotiations with all three and that some school divisions may utilize all three. Um, Tazewell County, you know, we're, we're certainly fond of Virtual Virginia. We have some experience there, but I'm not going to say that there might be students or groups of students who would be better served with Virginia Virtual or the Ingenuity. So we, we will have that opportunity. Uh, what the region will do is do the negotiation and there's power in numbers and we're a big, big area. And so what we're trying to do is negotiate the best price per student. And as we've said before, next year, um, our students, if they so choose, will be online uh, with one of these three providers, but they will not be um, with our teachers, so to speak. So our teachers will not teach Chris Stacy um, in person this week or this six weeks and next week teach, or next six weeks teach him online. Our students are going to have to commit to either coming in person or being online. And so here in the next couple of weeks, Miss Hill is going to, uh, and she may not know this yet, she may hear it for the first time, <laughs> but uh, she had already created a survey uh, asking parents uh, what, their, what their inclination is for next year. And again, some folks may not be comfortable making that decision right now, but we're going to start asking as many people as, as is sure what they want to do to make that decision now because some of the, uh, some of the systems Virtual Virginia, for example, they open up their enrollment March the 15th, I think, Ms. Mullins. And so if we have students who are committed to being online next year, we'll go ahead and get them registered and they'll be, they'll be signed up and ready to go uh, for when the school year starts next year. But again, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, what we're going to do is, uh, I was going to get to that. Um, this year, you know, the governor said we had to provide the online uh, learning and there really wasn't a lot of criteria for that uh, but what the region is going to do we're going to put some some criteria so that next year if you have this year you have struggled with online learning you have not turned in assignments you have not logged in you have been quote unquote truant um, you will not be afforded the opportunity for online learning you'll be an in-person learner and we have that guidance from the governor we have that guidance from the Department of Education and so there will be some criteria um, I will say strict criteria, but it, it will be firm. Uh, and so once that criteria is put out, you know, we will sh obviously share it with, with all of our teachers and students. Um, but again, there'll, there'll be some um, hoops to jump through, so to speak, to be an online learner. Um, I will come back to the board next month to um, kind of ascertain your, your flavor of athletics and whether you're in favor of uh, online learners being able to play athletics. And again, we can talk about that next month. But the, the big thing is going to be, we traditionally in Tazewell County, you know, we have a homeschool population um, that, that are online learners. And so once once all the criteria is set, all the vendors are, are uh, narrowed down as far as contact, contract negotiations, we will, you know, certainly broadcast this. We will certainly offer it up because now you can be through Virtual Virginia or, or any of the vendors that I listed, and still get your local high school diploma. You know, if, if, if having a, a Tazewell High School, Graham High School, Richlands High School diploma um, means something to you, you'll have that opportunity. And this is really the first time ever. So usually you've left us, you've went online, you'll get your diploma through whatever vendor you so choose. But now if you come back to us, you will be registered at, at our schools. And if you happen to be a senior, you could still get that diploma through us even if you're with, again, one of the vendors that I mentioned. So it, um, it's exciting. Uh, we met probably two or three hours the other night. And again, this is all 19 school divisions. And so lots of questions. Um, 
and I don't know that you know there won't be some some issues to pop up or some bugs that we haven't seen. But for the most part, um, our goal is to alleviate the burden of our teachers having to do double duty. Now I say that, but I also say that we are a Google division. We'll always have Google Classroom. Our teachers will still put their assignments up on those classroom or on the, those pages uh, because there'll always be a student who has to miss for for a stomach bug or a doctor's appointment. So we want them to have the opportunity to still get their assignments. But us having um, our teachers, you know, again every day at 1.30 go and, and work with remote kids or online kids or every Wednesday. Um, you know, today's the 130th day of school, so hopefully we've only got about 60 of those days left. And next year we'll be back in a more traditional setting with a different avenue for online learners. And along with that, uh, whichever vendors we choose to go with or the students go with, that vendor also takes care of all the testing and everything. Our teachers do not have to take any of that. Now, their SOL scores come back to our division, but our teachers and I will not have to take care of the testing and so forth either, which is a, a biggie. <laughs> oh, it's very big. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions on the virtual? John? But again, okay. we're going to put, we'll put the survey out here in the next week mm -hmm. or so. But if you're a parent and you, you are just not sure um, it's, it's okay. I mean, you, you can wait till the summertime to make that decision. And then, you know, some of the decisions may be, I want online learning, but then our criteria may, may negate some of those decisions as well. So we'll, we'll get the ball rolling here pretty and soon. And this will also be available for Rogue Tech students. Yes. If they yep. want to take vocational school, but they can't get all their other credits required in, then they could take this online and also go to vocational school, but take these online too. So sure. that will help some of those students. Yeah, there, there's lots of mixing and matching. Mm -hmm. And again, you may want to go to your traditional high school for six periods a day, but that mm -hmm. seventh period, you want to take a, a foreign language, so to speak, that we don't offer in-house or maybe a, a different mm -hmm. science or math that are not necessarily offered in our, in our setting. You could take one class, two mm -hmm. classes, something like that. So I think it's going to be our, a win-win for everyone. It's just going to take us a little while to get used to the, the formality right. of it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Go ahead, Superintendent. Oh, Superintendent's report. updates, and I'll try to be brief. <laughs> um, again, I mentioned today's the 130th day of school. We currently have 62% of our students in-person learning, or 3,273 students. 38% online or, 2000, or 2,013 students that are still online. Um, a lot of folks are talking about, you know, the governor came out and said, hey, schools have to reopen on March the 15th, which we all kind of chuckle because we've been open since August the 17th. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we have been in school probably other than Norton City, probably about as long as anybody in the Commonwealth. Um, that being said, a lot of discussion about five days a week. Right now, my recommendation is that we kind of hold with what we've been doing. We've been very successful going Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday in person uh, with Wednesdays being our remote day for all students. And that Wednesday allows our students to do a lot of their planning to uh, upload video, record videos, upload videos, assignments, um, communicate with students, hold Google Meets, all those kinds of things. If we started going five days a week, we still have 2013 students that are online and they need to continue to be online. That's, that's their choosing. So I think if we took away Wednesdays, I think our teachers would really, they're already stressed, have a, a stressed enough. Stressed. Yes, ma'am. I, I think that would really add to it. So my recommendation is we've got 60 days of school left that we continue the four days on one day uh, remote. Um, it, it's worked. It meets all of our criteria for the 190 days of school. We'll meet all of our hours of instruction. So I think for this year, we finish out the way we began, and then we hope next August to start back with five days of in-person learning and get back to a more traditional um, schedule. Um, our Wednesdays now, and I say that that's our remote days, but we've also started tutoring. So students are coming in for tutoring on those days. And pretty soon, uh, we'll be bringing in online learners for testing on Wednesdays as well. Our uh, writing window is week after next. And so, and then from then, it's just, we're on. <laughs> it's, yeah. We test for the rest of the year. So for now, I, I think, again, the, the four days on and one day off will work. Um, as you know, the 23rd of March, I'm going to try to pull my calendar up here, make sure I'm saying the right thing. The 23rd of March is the election. Uh, and so we had announced earlier that that week we would flip our days. 
we will go um, in-person learning on Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of that week. Tuesday will be our virtual day. And again, we, we said this last month. I'm just uh, reminding folks because it's the week after next. And then also um, the week of Easter, excuse me, Good Friday. Yeah, we will go um, in-person learning Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday that week. With Friday, uh, Good Friday, April the 2nd, will be a virtual day that week. Or excuse me, it'll be no school. No virtual, no anything, just no school. <laughs> and then the following week, uh, Monday, April the 5th, is Staff Appreciation Day, so it will be no school, no virtual or anything. Then we will go in-person learning the 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th. So we'll be in school four days that week, four days the previous week. But that Monday, and or excuse me, that Friday and Monday combination, those are just... Those are off, yeah, for everyone, teachers and students. And again, we'll we'll put that out, uh, broadcast that as much as possible in the next couple of weeks. Um, in the next uh, next two Wednesdays, March the 10th and March the 17th, we're going to have a lot of folks uh, taking part in mental health training. All of our school nurses, a lot of our counselors, a lot of our central office uh, staff will be taking part in this training. It'll be a combination of in-person and virtual. Some folks will be here at Taswell Middle School in, in this setting. Uh, other folks like myself, I'll be in online. Um, again, we've talked about the school shutdowns, and again, we've been blessed to be in school a lot. A lot of, a lot of locales have, are just now opening schools up, um, but we know mental health concerns are prevalent for, for all age groups, uh, especially with the shutdowns. So we're going to try to get as many folks uh, trained. Uh, obviously, we won't be uh, professionals after this training, but hopefully we can get some um, ways to help kids and maybe ways to help identify kids who may be in crisis or may need these kind of services. Um, I think I will shut up now. I just, uh, again, as always, want to want to brag on my staff, Miss um, Bailey as well, uh, just just everybody at Central Office. Um, a lot of times we, we seem out of out of sight. That doesn't mean we're we um, have our feet propped up. But any time I you know give give my folks something, they 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 take care of it. Our principals, teachers, everybody in the process. Uh, I know I say it every month, but I sincerely mean it. Uh, w what a joy it is to, to have the people that we have. Uh, you saw yes. the the food service ladies this evening, Mr. Jesse. But you know, all of our departments are certainly mm -hmm. worthy of coming up here and, and receiving recognition. And I know we're going to yeah. do that. Um, you know, it worked out well because this is School Nutrition Breakfast Week. But you know, we we fully intend on eventually having everybody come across the right. stage because what a what a special group of folks we have. Right. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, board member comments, Mr. Woodard. Oh, I'll try to do it. All good. Um. <laughs> I've got uh, some uh, concerns that I I'm getting mixed signals on um, that some some are under the impression that, that we can't fail online students at all if we show up and do anything. Um, others are saying, no, they've got to do the work or they want to fail. I don't know what it is, but I, I don't want any student to fail, but I also don't want any student who doesn't put the work in and actually learn to pass, so that's a disservice to them. Um, so maybe that can be addressed, uh, not to the board or in the public meeting, but uh, so that we're all doing the same thing system-wide and, and have the same policy uh, that requires work to pass. Uh, I think allowing uh, online students next year to participate in athletics um, this year has changed everything. I think that's one of the things that's going to stick around, so I, I'll support that when that comes around. And when we return next year to five days a week, um, which is mandated by the legislature, it's going to be state law as soon as the governor signs it, uh, I would like to see us shorten the normal day that we used to have. Um, I think that, that we found some value in not having kids there all day long and, and I think it'll benefit their mental health, I think it'll benefit athletics, I think it'll benefit everything all the way around. Especially if we're, we're probably now in one full day calendars instead of clock hours from now on. So um, that's something to consider. We added all those extra minutes all those years. And I, I can remember at least five years we added time to the day 
to breach that 990 clock hour. So that's probably gone, so those amounts probably should be too. That's all, Doc. Okay, thank you. Can I make a motion to adjourn now? No, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Warrior. Uh, you know, it's hard to believe that this time last year, Governor Northrum shut down public schools in Virginia on March the 13th. It's been a long 365 day journey, but Caswell <laughs> County Public Schools have survived in world class fashion, and that's because of strong leadership mm -hmm. and hardworking employees. The tireless efforts and sacrifices made by our employees is the reason we have survived and stayed strong. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. And I think that deserves a round of applause, even. I really do. Everybody who's worked hard, it takes a, takes a village. Uh, speaking of Caswell County employees, our cafeteria workers have been on the front line and have been true essential workers. They've taken care of the nutritional needs of our students each week, and they should especially be praised for the fact that they have worked consistently over the past 12 months preparing food for our virtual and in-person students. Hungry kids struggle to learn and thrive, and our cafeteria workers have fed our students and kept them happy, healthy, and ready to learn, and you're very much appreciated. Thank you to the middle school employees. Not everyone has what it takes to serve the hormonal cyclone that dwells <laughs> within the middle school population. And you play a vital part in our students' uh, development. That's very much appreciated, and we thank you for everything that you do. And it was uh, nice to finally be able to hear the preschool initiative presentation. I think they've been delayed since December, so it was nice to see what they uh, shared at the state level. Uh, it was nice that our school system was given that recognition. And it's wonderful to see that these students are being prepared, our youngest learners, for a life of loving learning. Uh, congratulations to our county wrestlers. As we found out tonight, I think the Tazwell's Josh Herndon, that's the first time a Tazwell High School wrestler has placed first in state, so what an honor that is. And Justin Fritz from Graham, four times, four. wow. But I wanna give a shout out to Brandon Phillips and Noah Spencer from Richlands. They represented our school with a third and fifth state ranking, so I know we're proud of them. Mm -hmm. Also, congratulations. I think all three county football teams had a successful Saturday with impressive victories. Probably not going to last long for some schools, but we'll, we'll take what we can get. Uh, as we focus on, and this is real important to me right here, as we focus on equity in our school system, I just want to say that I'm extremely disappointed with Richmond and the legislators of the House and Privileges and Elections Committee who voted to kill the proposed constitutional amendment that would have guaranteed equitable education opportunities for all students in Virginia public schools. It's disheartening that so little consideration is given for areas other than Northern Virginia, Richmond, and the Tidewater regions of our state. I hope that the Region 7 Coalition will work along with our legislators to speak up about the inequity in education for our Southwest Virginia students and our children. Mm -hmm. uh, we are Virginians and we deserve better. And in closing, I just want to say it's an honor to, to serve on this board. I, th I think we work well together. I think we've got a good team. And on that note, after much prayerful consideration and a little arm twisting, I've decided to seek one more term as Western District's school board member. Yay. And don't forget to vote on March 23rd. It's well, important. I'm not on that ballot, but it's important <laughs> that you get out and vote and support it is. our Senate seat. It is. And sorry I get nervous when I talk about it. Okay. Great job. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Hormonal Robinson. cyclone. I'm going to remember that. <laughs> I'm write that down. You're, you're living it, aren't you? <laughs> Yes, I, I taught am. middle school. Yes. Um, it's great to see all the fall sports back in action, and I appreciate the hard work and dedication each coach has put into making it possible. Last week, Graham High School celebrated homecoming, and it was wonderful to witness the sense of normalcy return for our students. Principal Brad Carr, Vice Principal Joanne Young, Athletic Director Matt Dixon, 
and homecoming coordinator Deborah Tabor should be commended for, for finding a safe and enjoyable way for our students to have this experience. Congratulations to the Graham High School swim team who did an excellent job representing our school at the state tournament. I would also like to acknowledge Josh Herndon of Tazel High School and Justin Fritz of Graham High School who brought home state wrestling titles. Justin has an extraordinary accomplishment of winning four state titles back to back and a fifth state title overall as he was part of Graham High School state championship football team. Good luck to Graham's DECA students competing in the state leadership conference this week. Ten students will be, will be representing the school. Finally, I want to commend board chair Irene Mullins and vice chair Donna Whittington as they both have hit the ground running in their roles. I appreciate their commitment to our school system. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Ms. Whittington? I didn't make a list this time, but I do want to recognize our um, cafeteria staff, food services for the great job that they've done. They, even when we were shut down, they had to continue working and providing meals uh, for our children and delivering them uh, when we were on totally shut down. So I appreciate all the hard work that they have done and the fact that they kept on trucking when everything else was uh, kind of on hold. Um, congratulations to the athletes who uh, won state titles. Very proud of them. They've represented our uh, division well. And uh, just thanks for everything everybody does. We do have a good team. I feel like we work well together. Uh, the It takes a village, and I think everybody is playing their part and doing their part to try to work together to make sure that our kids get educated. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to say a special thanks to Ms. Bailey. She doesn't like to be recognized, <laughs> but uh, we certainly appreciate her as our board clerk and all that she does um, behind the scenes for each of us. Uh, also, the cafeteria people, they really work so hard Please tell them, Mr. Jesse, that, you know, we just so greatly appreciate all that they do. The ones who weren't here, tell them we missed them and how much we do appreciate them. And congratulations to you on your award. <laughs> and uh, so proud of all the students. We've had so many successes all across the county. Keep seeing things on Facebook, on the sports pages of all the very student groups who go into competitions, track and swim and the DECA and the FBLA and, and all these other groups and all the successes they're having with placing in region competitions and all. And they're, they're doing great. Even in this pandemic time, our students are still being very successful and achieving and I'm so proud of them. And I'm proud of the teachers and sponsors who help them and the coaches and um, yeah, we're very proud of Josh Herndon bringing home the first Tazewell High School first place wrestling championship. That was awesome. And uh, Justin Fritz for having four years of first place championship. That's quite an honor. Uh, that's quite a wrestling family. His brother was also a state champion in yeah. wrestling. So they, they've really made us some great achievements in wrestling. Good. Yeah. He's a good football player as well. Yes. Oh, and his dad was state qualifier, so they're a big wrestling family, and they've done great. Uh, so we do appreciate all of our students, though. And there was something that happened this past Saturday I shared with a few of the board members earlier, something I had never seen in all of my years uh, with sports and everything. And I want to say a special thank you to Coach Jamie Harris he lined up the football team, the Tassel High School football team, in a dual line, and they cheered as the band and the cheerleaders marched into the stadium. Instead of the cheerleaders doing the cheering, the football team was cheering and showing appreciation for them being there. And that shows a unity of students and supporting each other. <coughs> and during this time of all the uncertainties, I just... I think that was something that just really touched me, and I greatly appreciate Coach Harris teaching the football boys to show that appreciation for the other members to be there and make that special time of football really special for all those students. 
And that was that was so great to see. Teaches a lot of respect and a lot of camaraderie between the students. So I appreciate Coach Harris and the band and cheerleaders all, but for him having the football players to line up and do that was, was great. And we had um, Reverend Lawrence Hayes was here to do the been at the uh, devotions at the beginning of the meeting, and he said something that I just kind of stuck, and I wanted to close with that. He said, dance in the rain as well as in the sun. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Yeah. <laughs> I'll second it. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.